Labour Party's first 100 days, unfortunately, is characterized by deceit and misery. And so as we focus on many topics, this part of my presentation will focus on the mismanagement of COVID-19, which unfortunately has caused many of our loved ones to no longer be with us. On July 27th, the number of COVID-related cases and COVID deaths stood at 88. By November 11th, just four months later, an additional 150-odd individuals have died. In other words, over 150 of our loved ones have died in four months, compared to 88 in the previous 18 months, or one and a half years. When we look at the number of COVID cases in total, the Labour Party in four short months have doubled what it took the United Workers' Party an entire 18 months to do. Our sympathies go out to those families who have lost loved ones and who are still grieving from the unfortunate mismanagement of the fourth wave of the pandemic. We're not here to play politics with the numbers. We are here to register our concern with this leadership crisis, which exists to manage the darkest health crisis our country has seen in its history. And so therefore, the United Workers Party remains extremely concerned by the lack lackluster, the lack of direction, the indecisiveness, the flip-flopping, the misleading, the deceit on various issues as it relates to the management of COVID-19. In our view, it appears as if the only science that the St. Lucia Labour Party administration trusts is the science of politics. And so, infected persons were left at home during the fourth wave to fend at least, at best as possible, at home. Some trying to fend alone or with very little assistance. And they were in the thousands, as we saw, the lines at the respiratory clinics were very, very long. A family in Viewfort, you may recall, would have lost four siblings, all of whom elderly with underlying conditions in the same household. There are many other stories like these, and many other families that are still grieving. Every one of us today that is watching this broadcast knows someone or live next to someone or would have been to school with someone who would have died as a result of COVID-19. This did not have to happen because as we came out of the campaign season for the last elections, the Labour Party should have known that there was going to be a spike and put the necessary systems in place to urgently arrest any eventuality of COVID-19 spiraling out of control. Workplaces are being disrupted as companies experience outbreaks. And you would recall the Chamber of Commerce and the St. Lucia Small Business Association have both pleaded with the government during the last hundred days to implement stiffer measures in response to what both organizations would have sensed as a lackluster, indecisive approach to the management of COVID-19. Bus drivers, police officers, tested positive at alarming and unprecedented rates leaving our health system overwhelmed and our transportation system significantly compromised. Adherence to protocols was left to the goodness of our hearts as we saw the new government chickened out and passed the buck. They shirk from their responsibility to protect and to save our lives because the only thing it appeared that they were willing to protect was their political 
future. Doctors, nurses and healthcare providers in the last hundred days were overwhelmed, overworked and in sometimes simply frustrated. Inadequate resources and supplies at the hospital were stories that became common in the last hundred days. Sadly, the legacy of COVID in the first hundred days in office is one of misery, sickness, death, and mourning. The St. Lucia Labour Party administration, while in opposition, opposed every measure we put in place to safeguard the people's lives and the people's jobs. No matter what we did, the SLP made it wrong. Whether we passed the COVID-19 bill, whether we instituted the state of emergency so that we can limit the movement of people through curfews, it was all politics as usual from the Labour Party. So when they became the government, what did they do? They sought to do the opposite of whatever we did, whether it correlated with the science or not. They wanted to be people pleasers, to be popular. They wanted to ensure that their political future was safeguarded. On the other hand, the United Workers Party administration always sought to do what was right to save lives and to save jobs, even if it meant that we had to spend political capital, even if it meant that we had to sacrifice our political future on the altar. They claimed we had our necks, our knees rather, on the necks of the people. So they went soft. They made light of wearing masks and they removed the wardens that did a tremendous job in seeking to enforce and to instill discipline in the country. They confined us illegally and treated us like second-class citizens in our own country. I am always baffled to see that the Labour Party that have derided us while we were in government for passing the COVID-19 bill. You would recall that they staged a march that their senators boycotted the legislative process. We had to cancel the meetings because the Labour Party said that the COVID-19 bill was unconstitutional. They went as far as promising that they would repeal the bill. But it's been four months now and they seem very happy to use the same legislation to manage every aspect of COVID. In fact, now they're celebrating the bill and they chose to use the COVID-19 bill instead of the state of emergency to enforce emergency powers, a vehicle through which you can institute curfews on an entire nation during a pandemic. It is very interesting, my friends, that the only major change the Labour Party has made to the COVID-19 preparedness bill prepared by the United Workers Party is to change the name of the command center. And so they thought that it would be cute and somehow a name change would have an impact on the number of COVID cases. But history has shown that just changing the name or just putting some makeup or some lipstick on an organization does not cut it. What is required always was, always is, and still will be strong, decisive, and visionary leadership, all of which we see is rather absent from this administration. They closed the bars, but kept big businesses open. And so while thousands of shop owners and people who uh, made their living by selling alcohol across our country, they allowed certain big businesses to operate and to open. Could you imagine the loss of revenue in these small institutions? Could you imagine the economic pain and hardship that this would have brought to many of those families that are self-employed, many of which we give income support 
while we had to close the country and to close economic activity in the earlier stage of the pandemic. They locked us up while allowing big bus loads of tourists to roam freely through our island on our precious Jeanne Creole weekend, showing no respect for our culture. But yet they want to say that they have made it equal for all St. Lucians. They want to say that they have made it equal, that there is not two St. Lucias. But all they have to do now, rightfully, is apologize. Because they have betrayed what they promised. They have betrayed what they campaigned on. They said that having two St. Lucias would not happen under them. But yet we see the cruise ship passengers. And the only reason that they have removed the lockdown Sundays is because that video has gone out. And so they cannot say no to the big cruise ship boats that are coming in. And so instead, they pander. They say yes, because you and I are not powerful enough. And our voices are not loud enough for them to give it the respect. But time will tell. When we were in office, friends, you would recall, and I quote Honorable Sean Edwards, we had a well prepared first class COVID-19 plan. And I quote him in a paraphrased manner when he attended the NEMAC meeting to initially launch the plan to manage COVID-19. You know why the then minister, the MP, the then MP and now education minister was impressed? Because the United Workers Party set a very stable foundation for the Labour Party. All they had to do now is to change the name of the command center. All they had to do was to put makeup on the organization. We had instituted the respiratory hospital in Victoria Hospital, it was done. We mobilized funds from the World Bank and other institutions so that VH can look the best it has in the last 40 years. We have instituted at one time up to 500 quarantine facilities using at least seven hotels in this country so that when St. Lucians coming from abroad and tourists who required quarantining that we had very good facilities to put them. We instituted and beefed up the testing at the Ezra Long Lab and also at the uh, forensic lab to make sure that we could have dealt with the number of cases that were coming in in the increase back in January. From the beginning of the pandemic we planned ahead and ensured that the Cuban Medical Brigade come to our country and give assistance to our doctors, our nurses, our police officers, our fight firefighters and all the frontliners, all of the people who were in the battleground to make sure that we can fight the COVID-19 pandemic effectively. It didn't happen by accident. When it was required, we made bold decisions. We didn't wait on the science. We were pushed by the science. And even when the science wasn't politically correct, we followed the science at all times. We give regular updates to the nation. You can see the leaders of our government the Prime Minister and other members of Cabinet were on television constantly updating the nation through this fight of the pandemic, ensuring that our country had a sense of urgency, that our country had a common sense of purpose by which we can fight one of the darkest hours in our history. But what do we see now? We're being told that today the National COVID-19 management team have a meeting and the press is barred from attending the meeting. Is this what we're coming to in this country? Is this the society that we want to build that not even the press, a foundation of our democracy, is not allowed to go and answer questions? In an important meeting, we want the frank and full disclosure on COVID. No censorship. 
no control of the people's voices. Let us be a proud, modern, liberal, 21st century democracy. Allow our oppressed people to come in and ask the questions. But I do ask the question now, Musa and Philip, what is it you have to hide? Why isn't the press allowed to come to the meeting? Why are you now pre-recording tapes? We always allowed the press to come and ask questions because we understood that the press was a very important stakeholder in what we're doing. And so, my friends, I am very sorry to say I am not hopeful about the next four years because if the last hundred days were anything to go by, then, my friends, I tell you, St. Lucia is really uh, going to see some dark days ahead. And so now they hide. Now they are forced to apologize over and over again when things go wrong. How many times will they have to apologize? Prime Minister Peer was left blurbering and repeating himself when asked, how was the science different from when the United Workers Party was in government? Is this why today that you are locking the press out of your meetings? Is it because you want to avoid another embarrassing performance at a press conference? And so we continue this fight to make sure that our society, that the voices of our members are heard in a collective fashion. I thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you. We take it back, we country. We take it back, we land. Tell them we coming, we coming, we coming, we coming, we coming.